Hey, I'm Scott. And I'm Chris. And this is Doxologic, where we help you think with your Bible. Well, welcome back to another episode of Doxologic. And Scott, it is uh, a joy uh, each time we get to be together like this, but it's a joy because I think you would agree uh, the summer feels like it's starting to come to a close. It's early September. Um, all of the coffee shops are giving out their pumpkin spice and all of this. And as we wind down from summer into the fall, just like what is one either memory or, or thing you just routinely love about this season as we get into the fall? Mm, temps coming down. Yeah. It's definitely one of the best parts. Yeah, I think about it like I think this year we had the hottest July on I, I record I in Sacramento, that. it was wild, so stinking hot. So I think the uh, temps coming down, um, it, it brings me back when you're talking about coffee. I was with Aaron. We were celebrating our sixth uh, year anniversary, and I did one of those husband check-ins, you know, like, yeah. hey, how are you doing? Are there areas that you think I could be a better husband? And she takes this really long pause, <laughs> which I'm going, if I took a long pause, it would be because I had oh, a lot to a say, lot to say yeah, and I yeah. got to organize how I'm going to say it. And she right. basically was like, well, I would like it if you enjoyed coffee with me more often. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that's great. But the connection is <laughs> that things. probably my wife's favorite coffee season is the fall, mm. very much because of the pumpkin spice lattes and all the, all things, the things that start coming out now. And so, um, yeah, just the bundling up that yeah. we don't get to do for a good chunk of the hot summer is... And, and now we are here and we drink We're having just, some. just black coffee yeah. made from... Uh, well, I don't know, actually. Yeah, I've come a long a, way, haven't well, I? That's what I was trying to say. Yes, I was trying I've to say you've come a long way enjoying just straight black coffee. That's right. Pour over. We're, it uh, is nice coffee, though. And, and this this is uh, Pastor's ben, Pastor Ben's enduring impact. Yes. When he came <laughs> in 2017, I remember this so well, his first month or so here, he was so dismayed over our lack of coffee aficionado-ness <laughs> right. because he comes into the office and all we have is uh, the K-Cups. Keurig? Oh, Keurig. Yeah. All we've got. He is just... Just mind blown. How do you get work done without proper <laughs> coffee? And now we've got the we've got the Keurig yeah. still. We've got the espresso, and we, he he has made sure we have pour over. Uh, so we are not uh, lacking any longer. Thank the Lord. Well, uh, we have got a lot to cover, and I know it probably doesn't sound like it because we've been bantering on about fall and coffee, but we really do. I think as always, a lot to cover. And um, here here's what this one's called today: Big Eva's Big Lurch Left. And and I would just say this by way of introduction, it's no secret, Scott, to anyone paying attention. There has been and is still major problems in many uh, uh, popular and or long-standing Christian institutions, right? You've got um, the realities of certain, you know, uh, undergrad, uh, as an undergraduate college, um, um, formerly well-regarded, just drifting, uh, sometimes slowly, sometimes, well, at least to me, what seems like all of a sudden, that's been around for a long time, but it also feels like in the last number of years, um, revelations have come about that this is not actually just the last few years. The revelations that have come about have shown it's been a longstanding issue, and one that we wanted to make sure we would cover today in light of a book that we'll bring up in a little bit, but it's really not about the book. It's about just acknowledging what are these issues, how can we identify them, and how do we move forward? Yeah, there's something, to your point, there's, I think there's a phrase, something like conservatives build institutions and then liberals take them over, essentially. Right. Right. And there's that pattern over time. I think of the once great years of Princeton Seminary, right? Sure. Producing some of the great voices of the past. And it ended up getting to a place where Westminster uh, Seminary had to start to preserve the you know, orthodoxy, orthodoxy yeah. and, and conservatism of theology that was, uh, that Princeton was departing from. And so uh, that's an example. There are many more that you could talk about through church history, but I think one of the things that's come up and why this is pressing right now, especially with COVID and the social justice stuff, and um, so much has come to the surface in churches and for church members, and they're picking up whiffs of something's off 
off maybe with the preaching of their pastor, off with the way the church is dealing with something. And I think a lot of what gets fired back is this, a kind of gaslighting. Like, what are you talking mm. about? Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong. And probably the, the problems with you, you know, you're, you're sensitive or you're seeing it wrongly or whatever. And, um, and I think a lot of people are just scratching their heads like, no, no, I think there's more behind that. And yeah. we're going to try to say someone's doing the work to figure that out. Yeah, it, it, all, it all felt very generic, I think, for a long time. You've got, um, again, longstanding institutions. Some of them are churches or ministries or uh, undergrad or seminaries, denominational names um, <clears throat> in terms of the names of the denominations themselves that seem to have been drifting, but you don't want to, you know, you don't want to... Um, think the worst of everyone sure. involved or you don't want to say that there's one th- thing over here that kind of you know smells it reeks of a uh, uh, a drift towards progressivism and liberalism in, in the religious sense of like uh, departing orthodoxy but but the work that we are so appreciative of that has come out um is is a book called Shepherds for Sale, and I'm holding it in my hands right now. You've got this as well. I know you've already been through it, as have I, by uh, a woman named Megan Basham, and Megan Basham works for The Daily Wire. She's been a journalist for, I want to say, around 15 years for a couple of, uh, at least a couple of different uh, important um, news organizations, and now for The Daily Wire, she was able to uh, do a years-long deep dive into just what is going on, who who is behind these kind of lurchings left and and what she uncovered was pretty shocking. And, and one thing, and this is uh, before we um, really get into the meat of this, maybe one thing that I think you and I, well, you and I were talking about, thinking through the subtitle of the book, How Evangelical Leaders Traded the Truth for a Leftist Agenda. And, and man, as I got done with the book and writing notes as we've been doing, um, one of the questions was even like evangelical, just even that, like, that, what that phrase mean? right now. Yeah. What does that mean? The way that it used to be used and the way I think it was very well understood historically uh, from uh, the fundamentalism of the 1920s and 30s and kind of into the 40s when Billy Graham in particular really started taking off in the Crusades and evangelical was a differentiator from fundamentalism, uh, which is neither here nor there for the time being for this episode, but to say the evangelical identity in in a conservative um, Bible, conservative, yes, usually politically, but uh, a around you know, how you interpret the scriptures, that the Bible is the infallible word of God, um, uh, that, uh, that the gospel is a, a, a simple uh, but life-changing gospel, believing Romans 1.16, that the gospel is the power of God for salvation, a, a focus on evangelism, right, thus the name. But man, it, it feels like that word, Scott, has started to uh, mean less and less as, as we read things like this book. Yes, it, it does, and it gets into... Um, one of the things we're going to talk about is just this redefining of terms, right? There is more and more that is becoming consistent with evangelicalism that was never consistent with evangelicalism. And it's being smuggled in, and it's being subtly smuggled in, and it turns out there's actually some big pockets behind what's being smuggled in. Deep pockets. Deep pockets. Money is involved, political persuasion is involved, and so what... Basham ends up doing is going through, as I mentioned, just thinking about people in churches and dealing with these issues over the last four years of things like, um, well, COVID, uh, she goes through climate change, illegal immigration, the pro-life movement, the Me Too Church 2 stuff, LGBTQ, critical race theory, all these issues that have popped up over the last few years. Now, she's going to say some of this goes back to your point, 40 or 50 years, and she provides all kinds of receipts on what she covers in the book. Now, we're not going to get into doing a a book review. In fact, if you want a book review, there are so many out there that are solid. We probably will throw a few into the notes at the end of the episode so you can kind of look through and get a sense for what are people saying about the book. The point of this podcast is not just to go through the book. You can do that on your own. The purpose today is you and I, Chris, wanted to reflect on what is revealed in the book and lessons that need to be learned, things that we need to have our eyes open to, not just as ministers, but as um, members of the body of Christ, and then therefore discuss certain ways forward 
um, that we need to be mindful of in our current political, ideological, cultural landscape. And so this is kind of the direction yeah. we want to head. Yeah, it's great. And you think about uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 28, uh, Paul um, believed that's to the Ephesian elders, yeah. right? Uh, the last time he was going to see them, he gives this just incredible uh, speech as it was, message to them. But one thing he says is this, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. And so um, with a verse like that and others that have that sobering, uh, somber reality about just um, what the apostles even in the first century knew was happening or what happened, we would say this, be on alert. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that uh, uh, the book... Um, if you choose to get it, it would be um, the, the message is, is there the same. Be on alert. And we want to talk about ways in which we would say, um, the, well, ulti ultimately, the enemy of our souls, that is the devil, who and, and he and, and, and spiritual, um, spiritual wickedness uh, infiltrates the church. It's not the same as it used to be. Uh, it's the same old issues, but it happens in a lot of different um, ways because of just the the day, the day in which the day and age in which we live. But Scott, you had found a um, just a wonderful uh, quote from Martin Luther, which is not from the book, but you had said it had come to mind. Why don't you maybe preface that and, and, and read that as a way to really jump into this? Yeah, I mean, I think as we process through um, the book, and you and I did this, we, we talked a lot about beneath or behind, and it, it's, it's explicit in the book, but behind what happens in each chapter and how you see this compromise start to seep into the church, like there is a kind of um, uh, undercurrent that mm -hmm. is, um, these are ways that the enemy seems to get in there. They're tactics, if you will. And we started to pick them out of the chapters and go, that's what we need to talk about. Look at that tactic. Let's be aware of that. And then let's make sure we're addressing those things regarding the most pressing issues, issues of the church today. And Martin Luther, of course, we know him as uh, 1517 Martin Luther nailing those 95 theses to the Wittenberg door and essentially unleashing the uh, Protestant Reformation, was also known for saying this, uh, really speaking into the responsibility of pastors, but Christians in general, of not avoiding speaking into those areas of... Mm -hmm. of um, church life, doctrine, and overall just experience that are the most heated in any given cultural climate situation. And he says this, quote, if I profess with loudest voice and clearest expression every portion of the truth of God, except that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christ. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved, and to be steady on all the battlefield besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. And so the point of this is, man, um, pastors can't avoid those pressing heated topics. It used to be something where I feel like you could avoid it. I feel like post-2020 in particular, mm -hmm. It's it's like, no, you need to hit these things head on, and there is an insidious movement of the enemy, tactics, if you will, that he's using, and so um, we're going to try to help break those down. Yeah, so um, get, getting into some of this in terms of like, okay, what are we talking about? Scott and Chris, I, I haven't read the book yet. I may or may not ever get around to it. Yeah. Just on a summary level, what, what sort of things were unearthed? And again, the receipts, if you will. I mean, I don't even know what percentage of the book, but it's got to be uh, more than 50 pages, I want to say, of, of footnotes. footnotes yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a very, very well-researched book. So the sorts of things are, you know the name George Soros? Mm -hmm. I, I feel like he's... Uh, I feel like he's like a super villain in a movie, but he's a very, very old man, actually. But uh, he's been around forever, it uh, feels like. But the guys like George Soros, and yes, no joke, actually him and others, other organizations, they were... They were 
um, coming to the understanding, and probably the 80s, but especially the 90s, that the, the voting bloc that was against their pretty extreme leftist agenda, the number one voting bloc in America was the solid conservative uh, evangelical churches and, and the, the Their people, greatest impediment. Their greatest impediment to pushing the, the um, progressive agenda that they wanted. Again, what, what we would say, it just has a, a just rank wickedness in its platform, right, known as the Democratic Party today, but even back then, 30 or so years ago, they began working on ways that they could rebrand themselves, working on ways that they could try to grab certain key influential people or, or and, or I should say, um, create organizations that would, um, we'll talk about this a little bit, use names, maybe it would be an acronym, or maybe it would just be a either a bland-sounding or Christian-sounding organization, a 501c3, that is about the following thing, is related to immigration and compassion or whatever it is, and they, they used that to railroad so many pastors, and it, it was very uh, unknowing. So they would get political uh, clout by grabbing onto a few key names of seminaries or pastors or, you know, uh, you know, insert popular authors, and they would start to really wreak havoc in especially certain denominations. The Southern Baptist Church is the, the SBC is the most um, prolifically written about one in the book, but others w would be included as well. Yeah, and so one of the things Basham notes in her introduction is essentially plays off that point. They were starting to realize maybe the most influential way to disrupt this impediment, this voting block that was keeping them from allowing their progressive agenda to go through smoothly was not just to try to convince the church from the outside, but actually to get inside the church right. and change it from the inside. So she's she's quoted as saying this, quote, how can one deconstruct an institution that provides hope and comfort to millions of desperate people? And now that institution is the church. Rather than go on opposing churches, the fill in the blank, right? They use the gay lobby here, but it could be a, a number of other um, uh, institutions or another uh, a number of other people. Um, they would need to co-opt the church. An engagement needs to come from within the churches. And so this is what they began to see. This is what began to give them success. And the thing that some people have been smelling in churches and they've been sort of gaslit about has actually been going on, sometimes overtly mm -hmm. and sometimes more covertly, sometimes with awareness and sometimes out of ignorance, but it's happening. And as a result, um, one of the things that's come up in the book is there's been a lot of um, uh, just kind of a, a, a very detailed look at those footnotes and some problems in those footnotes as a way to sort of detract from Basham's overall point. Right. And what's interesting about that is I don't think anyone's actually succeeded at detracting from the point. Maybe a footnote needs to be clarified a little right. bit more. Maybe there's some work that needs to be done in a follow-up to her book to just get a little bit mm -hmm. tighter on some things. But I think what stands is the people that are focusing on that are sort of missing the forest for the trees. They're becoming so introspective to try to um, take away from what seems undeniable, which is the general push of the book and right. the substance behind it. And oftentimes, and we'll get into of a number of ways that we have seen them try to co-opt the church in a moment, oftentimes it was about a certain key popular, let's just say um, still popular, and we would say faithful brother in Christ being named in the book. Yes. Right? So um, a, a couple of names, Gavin Ortland, right? Yes. Uh, other names like Tim Keller, um, some other names get mentioned. Some other names get mentioned, and everyone would say, yep, that totally makes sense. The person's gone off the reservation a while ago. Others could be surprising. And we're not here to name the names and play referee and all of that. You can read the book if you'd be interested. She spares no names, though. Yeah. Um, and so where, you know, uh, a certain footnote may have been inaccurate, um, but, but to your point, it's just like, do, do you see what you're doing, though? Right. You're going so deep into the book to just, like, maybe to get one of your favorites not to look so bad. And it could have just been an honest mistake. In fact, I think Basham dealt pretty fairly with 
a number of people sure. saying this isn't a, a referendum on their entire ministry, mm -hmm. but it was a bad year, <laughs> or or that was a bad moment when when under certain pretenses they started supporting something politically from the front, from their pulpit, or from their ministry, and so so much more to be said about that. But if you yeah. if if you look at some of those niche maybe Twitter sphere uh, or a, called X, obviously now if you look into those, you're like, oh my goodness, like is she actually a legit? No, she does such a good job. But let's now, Scott. Let's Let's turn and say, let's list some of the big picture ways that we want people to understand how does this get into long-standing church denomination and, and other organizations. Um, well, one of the most popular ways is um, church curriculums, right? Bible study curriculums that seek to address a biblical issue in an unbiblical way. Of course, and they that, don't say that. No, that's, no, not no, their, no. that's not their <laughs> tagline. <laughs> no, not their tagline. Uh, but but they're going to like, uh, what the Bible really says about yes. would be the sort of thing yeah. that is leading uh, away and ultimately leading astray in so many of these Bible study curriculums. So to name a couple of um, uh, curriculums would be Be the Bridge. Yeah. That's one of them. It's a racial reconciliation, at least so-called, a study. Uh, but they kind of mask their agenda, well-meaning Christians who do care about... And should. Yes, do and should care about some of the ways, uh, particularly in certain areas in our country and certainly certain um, um, eras in our country with plenty of people still living today who were in the, the, those eras 50, 40, 60 years ago. The point is, though, Be the Bridge is one of those that does a... Uh, <laughs> It does a very good job um, of overtly bringing in what's called critical race theory into the subject matter. That would be one, be the bridge. Another would be called uh, after party. Um, this is supposedly a neutral look at politics, basically. And the, uh, the, the two or three primary people uh, who, who wrote this advertised themselves as saying, let us, hey, pastor. Let us address these issues in a you know eight week DVD or maybe not DVD. Who does that anymore? An eight week online <laughs> course. I'm like, okay, DVD. Ever heard of it? Uh, I don't think you're buying those anymore for this. But an eight week online course, however many weeks. Let us do the political work for you. And if if they get mad at anyone, let them get mad at us, not you. Yeah. We'll teach your people political theology, basically. And it's coming out of like maybe Lifeway or something. Where yes. you're like, hey, that's a trust. Uh, publisher. That's a trusted out for me that I have been good with. And you know what? One of the what's one of the subjects that pastors struggle with the most? Politics, oh, right? Right. How to get into it? Um, admittedly, pastors aren't meant to be experts sure. on politics. That's not one of the check boxes. You know that scriptures. Um, you're like going. This is a major. You got a major in this. So why not? Why not farm out something that? Hey, a lot of people talk about it, and I'll just give it to mm -hmm. after party this curriculum mm -hmm. to basically shepherd my people. And in so comes the infiltration of some um, harmful ideologies. Right. Right. I think another um, just subset of this too would be not just what's going out in like adult ministry but what's going out in youth ministry, Sure. right? Because the youth ministry obviously is filled with students who are getting, and, and if you're in public schools and those kind of things, um, fighting with the latest um, forms of various kinds of indoctrination. And so they're bringing that in, and pastors are trying to address that and trying to minister to students, and it's a good thing. But again, they're grasping for sources as well. Mm -hmm. And so before you know it, it can actually be the student ministry that can cause those issues. But the bottom line is, as a result of church curriculum being such an easy way to infiltrate the church, man, it's got to continue to be a priority to comb the church curriculum. Okay. Yep. And um, it's not going to be perfect. So don't, I, I think the other side of it is don't freak out if something is missed, address sure. it. Assuming you're in a solid church, believing your pastors want to want to address those things, right? Versus being like, I can't believe you're okay with this. Like, yeah. admittedly, part of why this works is because curriculums are often large um, bodies of work that pastors spend have to spend a long time doing, mm -hmm. and typically are doing it with a bunch of other things going on. And so, if it's missed, just just make sure they care to comb the curriculum, and that if there's something serious brought up, they will address that and deal with that a curriculum in an appropriate. Way. It's not to say to never have it, although it is to say, uh, be very, very careful. Mm -hmm. And where you can, maybe it's better to not, you know, to depend on curriculum as much. So yeah. that'd yeah. be one. Um, another 
way that we saw consistently in the book as a way of infiltration into the church is butchering the meaning of the Bible. Okay. Um, I think people are familiar with this. Uh, the way love your neighbor got hijacked has been mm-hmm. hijacked. And the most egregious example, not from the book, but from our lives in California, was Gavin Newsom, wasn't it last year or something like that about Roe versus Wade? Yeah, that was the abortion he, thing, he, right? Yes, he put up uh, in other in states, other states. It was come to California regarding getting an abortion yeah. and love your neighbor. It was on his billboard. Wow. So that's just the way the world co-ops it. And yet, unfortunately, even Christian leaders, so this is just co-opted all over the place, but one would be, uh, how can you uh, love your neighbor if you don't wear a mask, if you don't get such and such shot or believe? such and such authority, government, and all of these things. And some of that's now years in the past, but it's still like, I mean, you know, if you get a little twitch when you hear the whole love your neighbor, wear a mask thing, you can be forgiven for the like flashback. And if you're driving and have to pull over because you start to get so upset again about all that, like I wouldn't blame you. But Rick Warren, even the the very popular um, former pastor of Saddleback Church, was identified or quoted as saying, wearing a mask is the great commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that's a snippet, but that was an ethos that was that that penetrated many many uh, churches that were Rick Warren and other sizes, and uh, untold numbers of people were getting that deluge of propaganda. Ultimately, that messaging, and 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 the mask thing is only one example, but it is um, it's so frequent. But there are other ways, Scott. That yeah that you could use the Bible unbiblically. Yeah, it's not just love your neighbor. It's uh, Romans 8.22. So Romans 8.22, this would be about climate change, uh, or or I think the term that they like is uh, to draw in Christians is creation care, creation right? Care, who, right? Who doesn't want to care for creation? Well, uh, verse 22 of Romans 8 says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And some are co-opting that to say creation is groaning under CO2 emissions, for example. Oh, it's right there in my text. That's I right think that's, uh, there that's in, in my the commentary. Text. <laughs> it's in my Paul commentary. was very concerned about yeah, that. Yeah. Now, it's not to say anything about the CO2 emissions thing, whether or not that's true or right. not, is a separate issue. It's about the faithfulness to the Bible and co-opting the Bible to make it mean something it doesn't mean. Right. Right. Even, even this is stunning to me. Genesis one twenty eight, which is such a wonderful verse in the creation narrative. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 and God said to them, that's to Adam and Eve, uh, he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Mm-hmm. Somehow that sense of dominion is looked at as a curse instead of a command mm-hmm. with a blessing. And so some of Even the, the filling the earth part. Yes, filling the like earth. Like having, like, it's positive to have kids right. and have more than a few. But is it can not get, a it can get uh, contorted in, in some strange way yeah. to uh, leverage a Bible verse. And this is, uh, just as you're looking up another verse here, to say that the danger of biblical illiteracy is not just seen, you know, when you're at church and someone says, open your Bible, and, oh, I don't know where the book of, you know, Jonah is. That That's not the danger of biblical illiteracy. The danger of biblical illiteracy is like Ephesians chapter 4, where you are tossed to and fro by every wave and wind of doctrine. That if you don't know your Bible well enough in an increasing way, you will be subjected to a well-articulated, uh, let's just say well written, meaning like professionally written, persuasive, maybe articles or speeches that will misuse and abuse scripture and get you twisted up because you're not in the word yourself. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think another term that's common right now as it pertains to butchering the Bible is just by blunting the Bible, hmm. using phrases like clobber passages. Oh, that's a favorite. Um, well, you don't want to what, clobber someone. What's a clobber passage? Well, a clobber, I have a couple here. A clobber passage would be maybe like a R- Romans 1 regarding homosexuality. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. I think about 
1 Corinthians 6, oh, verse 9, yep. Yep. or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? This is very, very serious, right? And warnings are baked in with mercy. This is There's a reason for these that's good for the soul of the one who heeds the warning. But do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So passages that become explicitly clear about something very, very serious, when it conflicts with the sort of LGBT, for example, agenda, mm-hmm. they're going to con- they're gonna conflate sort of the love your neighbor as yourself cannot use those passages because they're clobber passages. They're hit you over the head passages, and instead it blunts one of the primary tools that we have at our disposal, that is the grace of a warning or the mercy of a warning. Um, you're not allowed to do that, Chris. And... No matter, so so you just read six, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, verse 11, such a wonderful verse, and such were some of you. That's right. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. But here's the thing. No matter how well you attempt to thread that needle by making sure that the fullness of the gospel is in literally that very same passage, by the fact that you stand and speak clearly around those sins. And you, of course, uh, Paul only mentions, well, sexually immoral and adulterers and homosexuality, but mm-hmm. then he goes on to drink uh, greedy and drunkards, drunkards and yeah. revilers, and you, you, you shall not mention one group to the exclusion of the other. This is what we, our, our, our you know, conviction, of course. But the idea that you would mention those uh, anathematizes you from being able to compassionately Declare the truth. Yes, you can do it. Yeah, but but you are you are um, dismissed basically as one using yeah the clobber passages. They'll basically claim there's only about six um, passages in the Bible that say anything about homosexuality. That's a very popular kind of liberal progressive mantra. There's there there are so few verses in the Bible that actually address uh, um, either uh, homosexuality, of course, you know, that doesn't say anything about transgenderism. Well, that's what's so interesting about the Bible is that it's a holistic approach to see God's creation ordinances, male and female, he created them and and gave man and woman in marriage, for example, which Genesis 1 is is, um, teaching gay marriage, homosexual marriage is not God's design. And then it goes all the way through. By defining what it is. It it tells you what it's not. It tells you what it's not. So... So uh, Matthew 19, so uh, Jesus doesn't, does not say anything about transgenderism it is one of the uh, claims, right? Well, yeah. in a very narrow sense, it, people try to get away with that. But in Matthew 19, just as one example, Jesus saying, he who created the male and female from the beginning, he who made them from the beginning made them male and female. Mm-hmm. And they just have no time for that. But but the, the, a holistic approach to cr- Genesis and onward is to say, this is God's created order, his standard, everything that fails his standard, that falls short of the glory of God, is sin. And the the, the six or nine passages um, do help illuminate it. They're not the only ones, though. But you can get spun up yeah. if you don't know Scripture well enough to say, oh my goodness, there's only that many verses? And and the Bible never says anything about fill in the blank. Right. I could do. I can do that. Right, you know, right. I don't want to do that because I don't want to dishonor God's word. But I can play that game on a lot of things to dismiss a lot of sins by name. But the Bible does a God in the Word does a perfect job. The Word is everything we need to know God's will, His creational ordinances, and His law, so that we do no sin. And yet. So often, it's the hijacking of biblical terms, or it's the turn of phrase, or, or, or it's the Bible only says precious little about these things. Yes. More to get to on that, um, but hopefully that gives you some examples, and so let's um, dial in on that, right? Yeah. And yeah. really continue to... We've talked about this earlier. Like, if if we just... Sometimes there's this fear of like, oh my goodness, this could happen to us, and so what I need to do is become an expert on every new thing that comes down the plate and are, you know, down the pipe. Mm-hmm. And it's like... No, do do what the do what the guys that find counterfeit money do, right? Study the original really, really well, right. and then you'll see 
the counterfeit signs for what it is, for yeah. what it is and yep. the things that come. And so the same thing is true of the Bible. Don't necessarily, I'm not saying you don't have to like learn about these things. Don't feel the pressure that you have to learn about every new thing that seems to be coming down the pipe. Get the Bible down. Continue to make that the priority. Senator teaching that is helping elucidate the scriptures exegeting, mm -hmm, drawing mm -hmm. out from the text, not reading into the text, and that will help in your ability to go, I know the truth, right. and so even if I can't put my a term on this thing, I smell it for what it is, mm -hmm, and I'm concerned mm -hmm. about that, and that's sometimes all you need to be able to say, get the church on it, get your body of believers together, and, and you'll be able to kind of address that. So... Two issues so far, ways that um, a leftist agenda infiltrates the church. You have church curriculums, big one. Number two, butchering the meaning of the Bible. Number three, redefining terms. Very common, has been happening for many, many years. Terms get redefined. So one of the most uh, blatant ones has been the pro-life movement, and there's there's a lot to go down, but just to be fairly brief on this, the the idea, the transformation, if you will, of um, people demanding uh, pro-life must be pro all of life, and so they'll sort say, of a deflection, know, I guess, womb yeah. to tomb, or well, uh, um, if the if the mother has to have the child, then, then no one goes on to support them, you know, in their poverty or with you know, meals and diapers and care and all these things, and they, they start to expand. Pro life has to mean pro all of life, and what what really happens is that it it drowns out the paramount importance of uh, of the argument about abortion. And to say it, tr it tries to minimize that, uh, making it, well, if you're going to be pro-life, you have to be pro-everything in life. And something sort of similar, um, but what you, what you kind of weren't allowed to do was change the meaning of Black Lives Matter to, and expand to all that lives to matter. all lives matter. Uh, because um, there was even a local uh, sports um, commentator, uh, Grant Napier, that had uh, his... What, did he actually get this fired? Is what was, yeah. Did he get fired or did he get suspended? No, he got fired. Oh, that's right. He got that's fired. Right. Yeah, and it was on the issue he had put out on social media, all lives matter in the midst of black lives matter, yes. and that wasn't sufficient. Now, right. the, the issue is that it's not wrong. Of course it's right to say all lives matter, and of course it's right to say pro all of life. Right. The issue, though, with the black lives matter movement is they thought saw that as a, as a deterrent away from the point. Mm -hmm. That's what got a guy like Grant Napier in serious, serious trouble. Right. But when you do it with the pro-life movement and t deter the focus from abortion, that's seen as being... More acceptable more in some acceptable. ways too. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the things that they that one way they've done that. Another would be um, where you have allegations of different forms of abuse coming from spiritual leaders, uh, whether that's like spiritual abuse, manipulation, or sexual abuse. You've got through the Me Too movement, and it became the Church Too movement. This is 2017, 2018, and on. You you really started seeing people frame um, an allegation into trust the accuser about about everything all the time. So it wasn't just an allegation. Now that the person has said what they've said, they're a victim. Yeah. There has not been a jury. There may oftentimes have not been evidence uh, ever presented, or at least not with the accusation presented. And so the accuser is already a victim before any of this is presented. And what happens is you end up abandoning God's requirement for the evidence of two or three witnesses before someone is deemed guilty of something and 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 to be very clear because this is a this is a, about as sensitive a topic as they get there are many tragic examples of verified documented heinous acts of, of spiritual and, and sexual abuse uh, within the church so this isn't to say it's not happened but but one of the things that makes us so volatile is that there's also the reality of falsification there's also the reality of lives, be, and lives being ruined, ministries being ended with no um, restitution, no ability to see this person who ultimately ended up being framed and, and being falsely accused. That happens also. Families being torn apart where because the, the narrative gets going so quickly, the fact that a um, maybe a plausible uh, um, accusation has been made. Well, now we're going to call them a victim immediately. And man, I, Scott, I feel like that's been something that in the last, I guess, about five to seven years has been um, 
uh, this book helped me to realize, whoa, that's true. It, it, it used to be framed with an allegation had been made. Let's see how the evidence you know, can be brought forward. If it's true, let's get this person out of the ministry. Sure. Let's do all the right yes. things biblically to uh, that um, demonstrable abuse of their authority in someone's life or in a church. And yet oftentimes the person is ceremonious or unceremoniously just dismissed on the accusation alone. Yeah, and it almost completely uh, disregards the potential in some of these cases that, though not equally guilty, both parties could be guilty in some way. Right. Right? When you have this trust the accuser alone and the victim uh, kind of mentality in that, it's like no matter what, they're not only right, for example, but mm. they're ex the, the other side is exclusively guilty. Yes. And they talk about, she talk, gets into this in the book, but the trauma-informed tyranny that comes with a, a new way of assessing these circumstances and basically bringing this into kind of the legal context that frames a sort of uh, guilty until proven innocent vibe instead of a innocent until proven guilty. Yeah, yeah, very good. Well, fourthly, another way that uh, we, we would uh, describe some lessons just broadly from this book would be this, beware the authority of influential pastors on people. Mm -hmm. uh, many people, and I, and I think we would agree, even rightly so, they will be interested to find something, listen to something, read something outside of their own you know, churches, pastors, right? Especially the, the, the um, incredible amount of, of content that gets put out on podcasts now and all of these things and online and, and, and in books. But there is a, there, there is a, um, kind of a darker uh, element in that for Christians in what you would call binding the conscience, that maybe um, the Christian becomes unnecessarily uh, con convinced and convicted of something that a pastor multiple states away is is feeding into the mind of someone, and it, it, let's just call it um, an, an adiaphora. That's from uh, Romans 14. Adiaphora is, is something that is not doctrinal. It is more a life choice. It's a way of doing something. It's do you or don't you partake in alcohol. It's do you or don't you do certain things as a family. But the way the outside influence will bind the conscience is to say, and if you don't do it the way I do it, if you if you don't do it exactly you know when I do it or how, you are in sin. And by the way, your pastor is not faithful. Yes. Yeah. That I think happens is that, that someone they'll be listening, someone will be listening to a podcast guy who will make a really strong statement, bind the conscience. And and, and there's these battles uh, on Twitter too. It's the find another church thing. Yeah. If your pastor does or your church does blah, 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 find another church. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's just getting thrown out all over the place, yeah. right? But that influence when you make something binding or you make something a test of biblical fidelity that doesn't meet the bar of that level of seriousness to say something like that ends up stirring division and causing significant issues. So just to be aware that that's mm -hmm. something that influential pastors outside of your own church can affect the people in your church. Uh, another way, though, maybe on the other side, is the kind of vibe of, of certain pastors within broader evangelicalism that will, ex you know, the, the phrase is what? Punch right and then kind of reason with the left. Yeah. Uh, there's always P politically a, conservative. Yes. You, you punch, you jab, make fun of, or whatever. Call out, call out something that's an but extreme on the right. Everything on the but left. But then is, reason with the left. It's nuanced. Yes. and it's complicated, and it's compassion, and it's all this stuff, and and it's kind of amazing to see when there are some people that make those mashups, you know, and they'll put two tweets right next to each other or two short videos next to each other of the same person, and the way they treat one group and the way they treat a different group, you're just like. Wow. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, do you see yourself? Do you, can you tell the way you are uh, just kind of um, tiptoeing around mm -hmm. certain very clear biblical sin issues, and then the way you just, yeah, you punch right. There, there's, there's sarcasm, there's put-downs, there's whatever it would be, and that's a common thing in a lot of especially larger ministries by reputation. Uh, one that, Scott, you and I talked about quite a bit, this is still about influential pastors and ministries, they will nudge rather than shove. Mm -hmm. And and Basham brings this up, but you, you and I have seen this yeah. um, 
ourselves. Uh, Explic- let, let's talk explain about it that first. I okay, mean- so 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 let's just say the principle would be this: a pastor. Uh, I don't sees know, the change that needs pastor, to be made. Pastor, even the elders would agree there's a change in the church that is needed. The church has done something a certain way or, or, or held to something in a certain way biblically, and a change is needed. Well, let's not just announce the change, rip the Band-Aid off all in one Sunday. Yeah. The principle is patience. That change takes time. And, and we would say, in a, vac- in, in a vacuum right there, Agreed. Yes. Change takes time. You, you, people, if people are faithfully in a church for years and years, and there's a biblical um, a change toward something biblical that is needed, you still need to take your time with that. And yet, the nudge, don't shove mentality, while the principle is fair as pastors, we would say it's been used to nudge gently over years to the left or to a a liberal uh, lurch. Yeah. We were saying, like, so you do this long enough that before you know it, the person teaching you these very things is now a a female pastor, for example, that you never had before. Or um, the general idea is that you take a long, long time using the word to steer people away from the word. Mm. And so maybe it's yeah. a series you do, and you're not going to come out. So you're, you're, you say, that this, that like you said, the insidious side of this is to say you've made a change on your stance on homosexuality, for example. And rather than coming out and just being clear about that, you will use a biblical principle of wisdom and patience to introduce this that we think is wise when there's something good that you need to introduce. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, what it does is it further like um, makes this seem like a good thing when you're trying to introduce something terrible and and you do it subtly enough that you don't fully pick it up all the way necessarily mm-hmm. and it's couched in language like love and compassion and all of this stuff and before you know it the church has just fundamentally uh, shifted positions and carried a lot of people some people come and you know to t- see what it is for what it is and yep. and are kind of awakened to it but others will just be brought along in the process and they don't do it rip the Band-Aid off style precisely because it is more effective right. to take people from a position that they've always kind of assumed to a completely different position mm-hmm. over a slow, barely can recognize it. Yeah, so s- some of the ways you may see this is, you know, a new six-week series on or mm-hmm. what the Bible really says about, and I'm here to say six-week series on an important subject, L- let's have Great. that occasionally, right? Mm-hmm. Let's do a four-week thing, or it's like on Wednesday nights for four weeks or six weeks, we're going to, who you know, kind of whoever comes, we're going to talk through this very sensitive subject. So maybe it's not even on a Sunday morning, it's like on a Wednesday night, and you're, gonna, you're going to then have a consequence for the entire church and not the entire church was even there. And it doesn't happen in just four weeks. It happens over years. And so there's a nudge versus a shove. And that's such a, again, I would say insidious use of a principle related to patience that pastors indeed need to use. And, and and what they will oftentimes do in the middle of that is uh, they will they will equivocate, they will obfuscate, they will dodge, and they will remain silent. And and Scott, you uh, uh, just this brief quote from uh, John Calvin, who's known for saying ambiguity is the fortress of heretics. Yep. I just thought, man, that is just that short sentence can make you meditate a lot. Ambiguity is the fortress of heretics. Being being dodgy and obfuscating, which is to to intentionally uh, confuse or use a turn of phrase or maybe you use a rhyme or use something that like, huh, that um, covers your tracks in some ways. Covers your tracks. That's actually pretty, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And yet it turns out what you actually mean by one of those words yeah. is not what the rest of your church thinks you mean by one of those words as an example or yeah. whatever it may be. And so, man, that ambiguity, that obfuscation, uh, kind of the remaining silent on an issue for an overtly long time as you slowly move toward, again, the, just, just the liberal lurch is what we keep saying, but um, it is helpful to understand how this goes on in churches. Yeah, another way we have saw just a pattern of infiltration into the church is shaming Christians for bringing your Christianity into your actual life. 
Like, <laughs> yeah, shocker, right? <laughs> your actual you, you, life. You should yeah. be bringing your Christianity into your kids' schools. You should be cre- bringing your Christianity in with you into the spaces that you occupy, certainly into your home. Uh, so why not into politics? But of course, the idea is, man, um, they blunt a Christian's ability. They dull a Christian's light in the world mm. by shaming them, in a sense, things like, hey, stay out of politics, which, of course, now is a little bit ironic given the fact that so many of the political issues are so clearly moral issues, religious right? It's and religious and moral. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's yeah. technically always that way, right? right. You build laws off of a, a, some sort of standard of morality that you're trying to enforce, but now more than ever, it's so clear, but these are some of the, this is some of the language that, that happens, right? This sort of, um, you're being too political when you speak strongly about something mm-hmm. like abortion, right? Mm-hmm. Or any number of issues. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they'll um, they'll use projection as well in this, which is the idea of doing the very thing that you're claiming your opponents are doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would yeah. say Democrats in particular are very adept at this. They will claim so and so is going to be authoritarian or you know, fascism or whatever the popular wording is, and then you and then you take a second to step back and you look at the what's going on in the headlines and the um, the way corporations and government or private industry with government is no that's that's actually literally the definition of fascism mm. uh, for example of the private corporations that get in bed so to speak with government agencies and make law policy away from the the governing consent of the consent of the governed right the people and um, people will forget Christians will forget to your point here's a concise way to say it politics or laws are legislated morality Yes. Laws are legislated morality. Which morality? Whose morality? Right. It's not whether, but which. Right. It's not whether or not you have a moral standard. It's which one does your society seek to build itself yeah. a- off of, right? Never perfectly, even regardless of what we would say was the, if anything, the golden era of, Ameri- era of American history, uh, never perfect. And yet, whose standard? So legislating morality is what the arena is. And so to name Christ in that arena, to say that you do desire to see uh, God honoring laws, like the God of the universe, like the God of the Bible, Yahweh and his son Jesus, who is King of kings and Lord of lords, um, as Revelation 1.5 says, Jesus is the uh, ruler of the kings of the earth, and that you want to see that expanded into laws that will bless and laws that will bring a more awareness that there's a there's a creator God. Mm-hmm. You you get called all kinds of things. Of course, Christian nationalist is the most popular one right now. Destroying democracy. Destroying probably. democracy. Yeah. Yes, a, the, uh, um, a theocrat, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. A theocracy and all these things. Just you get you get slandered so quickly by that, and you get convinced. Oh, I better not say anything because I don't want to be like. I don't want to get treated like fill in the blank person that you see just just more or less um, at least Twitter crucified yeah. uh, in terms of the way they get treated. Another one would be this: uh, don't judge a book by its cover, which would mean don't judge or deem a ministry legit only by its name alone. Yes. This is where we get into another, not really redefinition of word, but the the play on words, things like the Evangelical Environment Network, which turned environmental uh, activism into creation care, or the Evangelical Immigration Table, which took an appropriate um, response to immigration into basically a call for open borders. Uh, the Trinity Forum um, is, is basically saying we should embrace a kind of pluralism that makes sure no religion is considered in any way superior to any other, and and that's very anti the gospel, anti the word of God. The, the, the Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. For example, um, but you think about all those names they've got buzzwords in there, right? Evangelical. Trinity. You're going, they're on my team. Yeah. They must be on my team. Right. These are things we got to care about, right? We should care about creation. Yes or no? Yes. Right. We should care about, you know, welcome the strangers. Yes. But they're, they're, uh, what would you say? They're, they're bringing in with that a complete way of doing that. They're right. going to, that's the problem. They're taking things Christians go, we should care about that. The Bible bears its weight on me to care about that. And they go, perfect. Let's give it a name. Let's, 
focus on something Christians should care about and find then let's tell to them sign- how to deal with that. Let's let's go ahead. Find someone to sign yeah. off on this legislation yeah. that they'll respect. Yes. And and that person may have very well been tricked into it, right? Like yes. who knows what they actually got sold. Right versus right. what it actually is, and then so and so's name is on it, or the denomination's name is on it, and all of a sudden, uh, several tiers down, for lack of a better word, the local pastors who do not have the time or knowledge to actually to- read the thing yeah. are looking at, oh, that's interesting. Certain Republican senators or certain uh, must be good, and then you, and then it trickles all the way into thousands upon thousands of churches that way. Uh, so that that is a that's just a, again the receipts. If you want to see the receipts, Seats are in the book, but to say this has been going on for a very long time. Maybe briefly, Scott, we'll mention a few more, and then we'll talk a little about the way forward as we see it. Uh, we've kind of touched on this one, but the problem of failing to call sin properly sin, mm-hmm. um, whispering about some things, right, has been, you know, whispering about sexual sin is one of the er- issues she brings up in the book. Um regardless of how you take what that came from, which is J.D. Greer's message, the point is there's an underplaying of of certain sins that need to be addressed either more overtly, more seriously. Mm -hmm. Um, It can't just be pushed, swept under the rug kind of idea, because what happens is if the church isn't saying something about it in some context or form, I mean, one of the reasons, Chris, we do doxologic is so we can address some of these issues Mm -hmm. that are going on, but not dominate the pulpit with a bunch of this kind of stuff right. and instead get to stick to the preaching of God's word and keep that as the priority. And then, oh, let's have those conversations through this platform mm-hmm. to be able to have these. So however churches do it, mm-hmm. the bottom line is failing to call sin properly sin then opens the door for someone else to speak about it. It's the, so, the whole idea of like, if the church doesn't speak about it, Satan will kind of thing. Sure. He'll continue to preach through various outlets of media and uh, television and all the things. Um, right. Another area that I think is important, and this has been true for as long as I can think of just many examples, but confusing impact with influence or respectability. This mm. has been a downfall of Christian organizations that eventually cave to the elites that they want to impress, whether it's academic, whether it's political, they want to be seen as one of us. The intelligentsia, well, at oh, the table, yeah, at the table, um, right? And and so they'll do what they can. They'll even celebrate it, and they'll catch quotes of you know. She grabs a few from Christianity Today, um, being able to garner the attention of like Mm -hmm. a New York Times or a Washington Post. Like, man, we've really made it when they think we're something legitimate, right? And there's a danger in that, and there's compromise that comes through that desire for worldly respectability. It will manifest eventually, typically in the way of caving into pressure, cultural pressures. Right. Yeah, and and maybe uh, you know, lastly here, um, playing on people's fears and anxieties is oftentimes a way to kind of uh, uh, um, prod people into a different direction. So of course, you know, with, with COVID, there was so much that we were told our lives were at risk, and and how dare we do this or this and come back to loving your neighbor, whatever is playing on fears and then anxieties, or the fear of getting a label on yourself like racist. Yeah, you don't speak up about um, the inconsistency of the BLM organization, for example. So the three-letter sentence, three-word sentence, "Black Lives Matter," compared to the organization and the the utter train wreck that it has been shown to be, the fraudulent uh, um, reality of the BLM organization is just one thing. I mean, a few years ago, that would that would be, um, man, you say that with great trepidation because you will be labeled this or that, and you don't want to be that, do you? And so you let somebody else do it, and so the, the common person for, again, lack of a better word, who's not got the large platform and the secure job or whatever, is not going to take a bold stance in a public square about that. They're going to leave that up to a handful of other people to do, and they will just prod people into kind of hiding and fearing and and or just, well, I don't want to do that, so I'm going to go with this group. So I'm going to be anti-fill-in-the-blank. I'm going to be the anti-racist. I'll be the anti-whatever-it-is. And 
Man, that has been an effective tactic, the fears and the anxieties people have around becoming a social pariah, um, which which is uh, pretty well documented as well. Well, Scott, we've said a lot, uh, and believe it or not, the book says more, um, but uh, <laughs> and, and there was a lot of eye-opening uh, things in it, but let's talk about the way forward, even briefly, because... Um, we don't just want to say, hey, uh, uh, there's a ton of problems out there. See ya. Mm -hmm. uh, best of luck, right? So so giving some hope and some, we would hope, we would pray conviction uh, to our listeners around, well, what is the path forward Christian and even pastor in a church? Yeah, I would say right out of the gates, just a commitment to bold leadership. And I feel like it's been pressing. I felt that as a pastor. Mm -hmm. There's just inevitably, and, and sometimes, and this is a bad mentality ultimately, but it makes sense as all I want to do is preach the Bible. But the point is that Christ needs to be applied to all of our lives. And so the Bible bears its weight on every aspect of mm -hmm. who we mm -hmm. are. And so the ability to say, I'm going to be committed to bold leadership, which means that you're, you're addressing head on passivity. Yep. Uh, certain subjects, uh, you don't have to be an expert in them. You just need to know what the Bible says about them, right? Uh, I think about things like CRT. That was an interesting one to untangle, right? Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes they are. And so I want to make sure we're not going, oh, this is all so clear. I wished, you know, pastors and people had seen this as clear as we do mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, this stuff is sometimes hard to understand. Sure. CRT is like woven up into all this other stuff that gets back to critical theory in general, mm -hmm. of which CRT is like a child of yeah, that. Right, right. And it's been around actually for a long time, and it's hard to get your arms around and that's intentional, by the way, but it's also okay to be like, all right, l let me take the time that I need to get around it as much as I can and try to preach to that when, when it's clear. Like, so just don't put it on the back burner. Be willing to engage and confront those issues. Take the time you need. Surface that with other mm -hmm. faithful men. Um, grab some guys that are doing it faithfully. And, and again, encourage, instruct, um, help your congregation forward, right? I would just add this one piece to um, to that. Bold leadership is not the same thing as have a hot take about everything. everything. Yes. Right? That's not instantly, bold too. Hey, well, instantly. A quick and hot take is oftentimes a quick flame that goes out yep. because you're committed to, maybe it is, whether it's clicks or intrigue or outrage, sensationalism. Just don't hear bold leadership means get out in front of everything faster than everyone else. Yes. Bold leadership can also be to your people yeah. when they come asking a week after something explodes on the internet, hey, I've had a week getting ready for sermon, doing counseling, leading in the church. I don't know enough about that. And I'm boldly going to tell you, church folk who I love, uh, I'm not even going to speak into that yet. There might be somebody else that will be worth listening to. I might point you to, or just give me some time. And there's so, often wisdom to that, right? Boldness, just in general, even to in your, your point, even in your patience um, for yourself and for your people. Uh, secondly, though, along with bold leadership for the pastor is bold preaching. Mm -hmm. uh, this does not need a whole lot of time, but it should never be um, gone. It should never go unsaid to be standing on the preaching of the word in a First Timothy four type of sense. And I'll just turn to this briefly, uh, just because it's like almost memorized, but. Uh, I just don't want to get it wrong here. First Timothy four, second, second Timothy four. Sorry about that. Second Timothy four, Paul to um, Timothy, preach the word. Uh, well, first of all, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom. That's verse one. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. This is tough with complete patience. <laughs> and teaching. So that's, again, take the long road, even in your bold preaching that does not avoid uh, what is in God's Word, uh, recognizing that it's with complete patience towards God's people and committed to teaching, training, teaching, equipping. Love it. Those go hand in hand. Uh, undergirding that, another thing I think we need to be really serious about, and this goes for every Christian, is just the commitment ongoing, Lord help us, hold each other accountable, fearing God over man. Just mm. continue. Let yeah. it be a refrain of your life. Nothing has really changed. These are good biblical principles, but they're to be applied in these ways. Because when you start to fear man over God, 
compromise starts to happen inevitably because you're looking to please man instead of God. Mm -hmm. Fearing God is being willing to stand even if you are alone on what God says, regardless of what the world thinks about that, regardless of what they call you. And frankly, it's getting worse what they're calling us than right. what was before. And that will probably escalate, but making the commitment now that we are going to, you said, exercise the muscle of not caring in the right way. Right. When it comes right. to being influential in any worldly sense, don't worry about that. That's not our responsibility, right? If God wants to give influence, that's a whole, that's his prerogative. True. And even when you have it, it's really dangerous ground to be standing on in general. Lord, help us. I think of John MacArthur, who's what, 84 yeah, years old, like who that. just goes, Lord, keep me from misstep, you know, being this many years faithful. So fearing God over fearing men to continue in that way. Yeah. Uh, we, we would say a couple of words, that one, one word of caution in this is not to go so far as to believe the worst about everyone, yeah, right? Like when, skepticism. When, when if you read the book and someone's name comes up, then you just, oh, I've read two of their books. I have been duped and everything. No, no, no. Cal calm down. You can take a breath. Some people have had some bad moments. Some people have um, gotten shaky on some subjects. It doesn't, vi it doesn't um, necessarily say their entire ministry is, is invalid. Okay, again... Tim, Tim Keller's name came up. I'm not interested in, in giving anyone advice. Should I or shouldn't I read any of his stuff? He's now long gone and with the Lord and in glory, first of all. But, um, okay, I, I, read a t I read his stuff, like everything that came out for 10 years. Really fell away from following him in his last six or seven years uh, by way of reading anything or listening. That doesn't mean I would chastise somebody for enjoying something of his. His devotional stuff, for example, on some subjects was unbelievable. Yeah. And I will stand by that. And I'm not going to uh, bind someone's conscience, speaking of, to assume the worst about everyone because, well, their name shows up over here. Wait a minute. You can, you can really go too far in your skepticism, Christian, that as soon as one person has a shaky moment, you are, uh, again, kind of anathematizing and just never going to cross, um, uh, you know, they're never going to grace your presence again with ever reading them. We can or watch out for that. you can benefit from them, right. or um, I think we need to be more gracious just in this category in general, but it gets into another one of the things we're talking about, mm. which I'm going to drop down just to say, because I think it ties in well, is we, we're talking about it like this, like your Christianity needs to be tribes, yeah. not tense, nor hyper tribalism. And it's the sort of idea where, um, man, we, we, sh we need to have, uh, I think, a uh, bigger heartedness towards believers that are generally in your same camp. And so when I say tribes, I mean, you need to have certain lines that you say, these are faithful people because they hold to these standards biblically that say, this is healthy to participate mm -hmm. and partner with these kind of churches, right? Right. Um, it can get so broad and so expansive. You're pulling in people from all kinds of varying positions that makes it more of the tent mentality. Let's just bring them all in here. And before you know it, you have this kind of ecumenical, everyone's cool. More of a circus. Yes. The big tent is yeah, yes, more exactly. of a circus. Exactly. And, and you're trying to justify circus. all yeah. these sort of things. But then there's another proclivity on the other side, which is very popular right now, which is this hyper tribalism, which is taking like the 2% of the most conservative theological grouping of people people in existence today and dividing that into the most minuscule little slivers um, of rightness, essentially, and, and, and pushing out everybody else that would largely agree with you. So right. we're saying draw lines, but sometimes it can be so... Uh, I, I said it in a message one time, it, it can kind of strain, you can strain out the theological mm. gnat and end up swallowing a prideful camel kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, an, another word of caution would be to avoid the idolatry of a celebrity. Uh, and 1 Corinthians, uh, particularly chapters 1 through 4, really talk about this, um, the idea of do you follow Paul or Apollos, or even uh, Jesus gets mentioned in there, you know, which is very popular. I don't, I don't follow anyone. I only follow Christ. You're like, well, but, but like having pastors, having counsel, uh, look, we would say, uh, you know, read the dead guys or whatever, but realize that no one living or dead got it all right all the time. They, they didn't get every a church situation perfect, you know, in terms of some controversy or the way they handled something. Uh, you know, Luther and Calvin, some of the most popular names in the, you know, Reformed world, ha they had their issues, they had their—you'll um, read their biographies, and you're like, man, that was messy. 
Very messy, in yeah. fact. Uh, even even sinfully so by way of you know what Luther would write about certain groups of people and whatnot. The, the Puritans, you know, are should be largely respected and 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 read widely theologically. Yet they didn't nail everything either. They were people of their time. They lived in a certain era, and and, and the same will be said about us when we did not get everything perfect. And so avoid this this identity, um, you know, um, a, a certain person, we would say you got to watch out for that, especially those who are very recent, and we start to pit people against one another. Um, we need to watch out for that, but it's so, so common. Um, and I think the last thing we would just say in conclusion is <laughs> it's going to be interesting to flesh this out, but to be a Spurgeon. And you're like, what the heck does that mean? Be a Spurgeon. Well, uh, one of the things that's interesting about the way uh, she ends the book is she speaks about Charles Spurgeon, who lived in the time of Karl Marx. You may know the name. Karl Marx. Both lived in London in the mid-19th century, and Spurgeon was, of course, a faithful preacher. He was actually wildly popular uh, because of how gifted he was. Then you had Karl Marx, who, of course, is the father of Marxism, communism. Uh, he rejected the Christian influence he actually grew up with, um, spoke of it in very deplorable language, and um, yet had some very influential uh, writings, of course, one of which you know is the uh, Communist Manifesto. And it was interesting. So Frederick Engel, the co-author of Communist Manifesto with Marx, was asked by his daughter in his old age who he disliked most in the world. And he said, clearly, Spurgeon. Here was the quote from the book. Engels believed a counterfeit form of Christianity could be used to advance the cause of socialism as both ostensibly addressed uh, the issues of what he called the laboring and the burdened. A true shepherd like Spurgeon necessarily stood in the way of such efforts, reminding the world that mankind's greatest need was not a social project, not power over his oppressors, but forgiveness from his sins. True Christianity promotes not grievances, but gratitude. Mm. There's little doubt Marx and Engels knew this. In other words, be a Spurgeon. Yeah, such a good word, because what we need to be reminded of sometimes is that we do live in a unique era in some ways, but we don't live in one that's never, like, it's unprecedented. No, yeah. you've got examples, Charles Spurgeon being one of them, when you see whatever we want to call, whether it's leftist or liberal or progressive, of course, you know, Marxist and all of these things, you've got faithful uh, men and women who have stood up against that, and when you have the power of the gospel on your side and the word of God uh, um, deeply uh, by conviction, you're living your life from it, you are preaching it, you are able to really wield a kind of power that is stunning to look back on, right? Because because this is still today such a dividing line between maybe Marxism and its counterfeit Christianity versus a full-throated gospel like Charles Spurgeon preached. And he he saw the um, devastating kind of consequences before they were really fully borne out. But he was uh, smart enough to know and speak against it. But it wasn't Scott. It wasn't like his life became identity. Uh, um, uh, totally bound up in this. Yes. He remained faithful to the preaching of God's Word yes. week in and week out, and at times he would he would talk about the dangers of what he saw happening around him, but his main focus always remained the Word of God, shepherding God's people, and not um, diverting from that and focusing his sole attention on this one issue that we can we can learn a lesson from that I know I can and and I hope that we would all be able to uh, be wise enough to remain focused on the word our noses in God's word to your point about study the real thing so you can identify the counterfeits and be um, go forward in boldness trusting in the Lord. Yeah, couldn't uh, agree more. Well, we hope uh, this has been encouraging and helpful to you. Um, listener, thank you, as always, for the time. We appreciate the encouragement that we get from so many of you, the the, the ratings and reviews. We want to say that on whatever uh, app you use, the Apple Podcast app or Spotify app, whatever you're using, you can always uh, find a way to leave a review, and uh, we appreciate that because it does help get the word out. We pray that you will uh, be blessed by this, and we look forward to seeing you next time. You've been listening to Doxologic, a podcast by Doxa Church in Rockland, California. 
To learn more, visit us online at doxa.church. <laughs>